So welcome everybody to the HR huddle. Um, for those people that don't know me, because I am conscious we've got new people, I'm Eloise Shelton, uh, MD and founder of Vanilla Recruitment. We specialise in HR recruitment, marketing, sales, accountancy and office professionals, predominantly across the East Midlands. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to manage flexible working um, working requests, especially in relation to um, COVID-19. We're really lucky to have Keely Bajant of KSAB Law with us again. Um, she's going to um, do the most of the session, but we will have time for a Q&A session. So if there's any questions that you want to ask through the session, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will ask um, Keely for you as, we, as we're going along. So enjoy the session and thank you, Keely, once again for, for joining us and being with us. And I will, um, I'll pass over to you. Hello everyone and welcome then to the HR Huddle today on managing flexible working requests in the age of COVID. Um, so today I'm going to be dealing with the statutory um, flexible working regime, um, including eligibility, uh, making a request, um, the procedure um, to be adopted, the ground on which a request can be refused or rejected and the claims that can be made. Also, I'll be um, going through some practical steps that you can follow in dealing with requests. I'll then move on to have a look at um, what employers have indicated that they're doing now um, to preempt flexible working requests. Um, and then um, I'll finish off with um, a section about uh, issues that may arise when people, when employees return to the workplace um, surrounding vaccinations. So there's quite a bit to get through. Um, I'm going to share my um, screen now for the slides. Can everyone see those? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so um, I am going to first of all then deal with the statutory scheme um um so looking then first at the right um to request flexible working employees have all have had the um right to request flexible working for some time and actually it's been in force um, since the 6th of April 2003, and that was in relation to, um, to working parents. From the 30th of June 2014, the right was actually extended to all employees, so not just working parents. Um, and um, that related to employees with 26 week service or more. Uh, currently then, as we know, the majority of the UK's workforce he is working from home um, and uh, remote working has become for many employees the norm. Um, employees have got used to this and they're obviously um, noticing some benefits from that including uh, avoiding the stressful commutes or time consuming commutes, saving money on travel and food, uh, managing work more efficiently, fewer interruptions and seeing their families, children more. So as the pandemic passes and employers are required to consider whether or not they want to bring their employees back into the workplace, um, there may be um, a number of flexible working requests made by employees um, who want to continue with what they have experienced to be in part a beneficial experience. So we may well see um, uh, a number of claims being made by employees to continue working at home. So this, re this right to request flexible working then is set out in the Employment Rights Act in sections 80F to 80I. The scheme is supported by um, two ACAS documents, so the ACAS code and the ACAS guide. Um, and the Employment Tribunal must consider um, the ACAS code when dealing with any complaints made by employees um, in relation to the right to request flexible working. So it's really important that employers do consider the code as much as the legislation 
um, in, in dealing with the requests that may be made. It, it's a short document, actually. Um, the code, it amounts to only 14 paragraphs and it's only set out on three pages. So I definitely uh, recommend that employers read that document. Um, if they are dealing with a right to um, request flexible working from an employee. So who can exercise then the statutory right to request flexible working? Um, well, there is a, there's actually four eligibility criteria. They are detailed on the slide, but I'll go through them with you. So the first one of these is that a statutory request can only be made by an employee. So we're not looking at dealing with requests under the statutory scheme from um, workers or um, obviously self-employed people. Um, and it's only by an employee that um, these requests can be made. And that can be a permanent employee. It can be an employee working on a fixed term contract, or it can be an employee who's currently working under a flexible working arrangement. So they aren't excluded. Um, and as long as it's an employee, then um, they, can, they can make a request or make an application under the scheme. The second criteria is that the employee must have at least 26 weeks continuous service of employment um, by the date on which they make their request. Um, and the usual rules um, relating to continuity of service apply. Um, so the service with an associated employer or service prior to a GP transfer, for example, will be included. The third criteria then is that only one request can be made in any 12 month period. So an employee can only make that one request under the statutory scheme in any 12 month period, time being counted from the date on which they make their request. So it's not the decision, it's from when they make the request. And, and that's important actually, because that's irrelevant or that's relevant even to a situation where an employer's um, business arrangements change. Um, or the individual circumstances of an employee change. So that even if those changes take place within the 12 months, an employee still can't make a further request under the scheme. They're stuck with the arrangement if it's been made within those 12 months. Now, I'm not saying that an employee um, could make an informal request um, to change um, their working arrangements if they um, if things change within the 12 month period. It's just that they can't make a request under the, under the actual statutory scheme. Um, and then finally then the fourth criteria is that a request cannot be made by any agency workers with the exception actually of those returning to work from a period of parental leave. So just bear that in mind on, 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 that, uh, on that criteria. So what kind of change can be applied for? Well, it's pretty much any change in relation to an employee's working arrangement. So the list in the statute is um, a change to the hours an employee works, a change to the times when they are required to work, or a change to the place of work. But underlying those three categories, it's pretty much everything and anything in terms of working patterns. So it includes applications for part time working, full time working, um, annualized hours, compressed hours, flexi time, home working, job sharing, self rostering, shift working, staggered hours, et cetera, et cetera, or term time working is a, um, 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 a good example too. But so there's very few limits as to what an employee can request in terms of changing their working pattern that will be caught by this statutory scheme. Also, it's worth um, noting that although it's usual for a request for a permanent change to be made to the employee's working pattern, an employee can make a request to change their working pattern temporarily. So that is caught as well. 
Um, but as I say, permanent changes are usually the ones that employees are seeking when, when making these requests. How does an employee make a request then? Um, so an employee's application must be in writing, it must be dated, it must state that it is an application made under the statutory procedure, it must specify the change that the employee is seeking and when they wish the change to take effect. It must explain what effect, if any, um, the employee thinks the change would have on the employer and how any such effect could be dealt with. And it must also state whether the employee has previously made an application to the employer, and if so, when that was, just to check that um, that falls outside of the 12 month period. Um, the ACAS guide also suggests that where the employee is making their request in relation to the Equality Act, for example, a reasonable adjustment um, as a result of, of having a disability, then the employee should actually state that in their request as well. Um, obviously, it's likely to assist both the employee and the employer uh, if the employee details as much information as they possibly can as to the reason why they're seeking a change to their working pattern. Um, and um, any relevant circumstances, so that the employer can then um, uh, give that request, that application, um, proper consideration. So um, how should an employer deal with a request then? Um, it's actually detailed in legislation um, the um, in, in the sections of the Employment Rights Act and um, how an employer should deal with a request, albeit briefly. So um, the prescribed manner is firstly employees are required to deal with requests in a reasonable manner. Um, and we have to apply a common sense view on this, but also we have to look to the ACAS code and the ACAS guide. Um, which details um, what is deemed to be um, a reasonable manner in the circumstances. So um, as detailed in the guide, the first recommendation is to discuss the request um, with the employee. Common sense to us, um, uh, inviting the employee to a meeting at which um, their request, their application will be discussed. Um, Discussing the request, obviously, with the employee will enable the employer to get a better idea of what they're seeking and the reasons behind that. Um, and even if the um, employer is minded to accept the request, albeit um, although the legislation um, or the guide indicates that um, a meeting or a discussion does not necessarily have to be held, it's probably wise even in those circumstances to have a discussion with the employee just to go through any changes that may need to be made um, to their contracts, which inevitably there will be, um, and, and, um, and the... Uh, uh, the repercussions of that and the consequences of those changes with the employee. So as I say, even if a an employer is minded to make the change that the employee is requesting, I would still suggest discuss it with the employee and go through the relevant matters with them um, that apply to that change. And it may be um, that um, the employee um, um, has to incur a decrease in pay um, or um, or changes to how they conduct work um, if their request is granted. So it's it's good to discuss those consequences with the employee so that very so that they are very clear um, what they are. Um, the next recommendation in the ACAS code in order to deal with um, a request in a reasonable manner is to allow the employee to be accompanied by a work colleague or a trade union representative um, at the meeting to discuss their request or any resulting appeal. So um, again, um, procedurally, we would probably do this anyway, and we're used to it anyway. Um, uh, just make sure that you do um, inform the employee 
of their um, right to be accompanied at these meetings prior to the meeting um, taking place, usually in the letter, inviting them to the meeting to discuss the um, flexible working request. The third recommendation then is um, to arrange appropriate venues for meetings. So making sure that it's in a location or in an office that isn't going to be overheard by people if we're doing it face to face. Obviously this day, uh, this day and age that we're in, um, most meetings are being conducted virtually. So um, again, um, setting that up and making sure the employee is able to um, access um, those virtual uh, meetings. Finally, then, in dealing with the request in a reasonable manner, the ACAS code makes suggestions with regards to the approach um, that needs to be taken in dealing with the request. Um, it does suggest that employers should consider these requests carefully and give them due consideration. Um, don't just reject them, um, you know, without, without considering them fully. And... Um, weighing up both the benefits to the employee as well as potential benefits to the organisation and, and weighing those up against the um, adverse impact on the business if there is deemed to be one. So moving on then to the, um, uh, the second requirement of the statutory scheme. Um, and this is that the employer must notify the employee of its decision within the decision period. So there is a decision period that is prescribed in the legislation. Um, this decision period, and that includes any appeal um, that may result, um, is three months beginning with the date on which the employee's request is made, or such longer period as the parties may agree. So, um, an employee's request is taken to be made on the day it is received by the employer. So that's when your three months starts to run. So um, once it's received, and, and we're looking at ways in which it could be received, so it could be received by email electronically. Um, so that's when you receive the email into your inbox. Um, if it's by post, it's the ordinary postal um, uh, service and then um, if it is hand delivered it's obviously on the day that it is delivered um, it's deemed to be received so that's when the three months starts to run so I mean although three months seems quite a long time obviously if you're trying to fit in any appeal during that time um, we need to deal with it promptly Um, so in looking at then the agreement to extend the decision period, the agreement has to be made before the end of the three months. So if you're going to run out of time and not deal with the request within three months, then we'll need to seek agreement with the employee to extend that three month period within the original three months, or if we get to the end of the three months and we still haven't dealt with it, we need to approach the employee and ask them to agree that we deal with it in a further three months. So um, it's then a retrospective agreement to deal with it um, within um, another three months, but we must get the employee's agreement to that, to do that. So, I mean, if we know time is going to be running out, within the three months, then we need to contact the employee and just seek their agreement to extend the period, obviously explaining the circumstances as to why it can't be dealt with within the three months. Trial periods then. Um, there's actually no um, provision within the legislation or the code um, that actually tells us we should offer an employee a trial period if we're considering rejecting the request. However, it may be good practice to do so, um, particularly if the employer isn't sure whether or not the request can be granted um, or isn't sure about the 
um, repercussions of granting that request. A trial period um, is then quite a useful thing. Um, obviously, if you are going to offer a trial period to the employee, then we need to make sure we agree with the employee an extension to the three month decision period um, to make sure we don't um, uh, um, breach, the legis breach the legislation and, um, and, and, go and, and, and that time limit expires before we make a final decision. Because inevitably giving an employee a trial period is going to mean that we potentially run out of time on that decision period. Um, yeah, so if, if the employer accepts the employee's flexible working request, all the parties reach an agreement on a variation of the request, a compromise position um, uh, at a discussion meeting, um, the new work pattern will be a contractual variation to the employee's employment, um, and it will be permanent unless otherwise agreed. So because of that permanent change to the employee's terms and conditions, we are obliged to issue that section four statement, so a written, written statement of changes to the employee's employment within one month of the change occurring. Um, also good practice to um, issue a new contract or if we don't want to go and issue a whole new contract, at least a variation letter um, seeking the employee um, to sign the um, document to confirm their agreement to it, date it and return it to it so we can hold it on their personnel file. Um, obviously, once then that contractual change is in place, um, any further change to that situation will need the agreement of both the employer and the employee. Um, and also uh, bear in mind that 12 month period during which the employee cannot make um, a further statutory request to um, change their contracts again. The third requirement then of the statutory scheme is that a flexible working request can only be rejected on eligibility or technical grounds or refused on one or more of the eight permitted grounds. So if either the employee, um, so if either the employee is not eligible or the employee fails to comply with the procedure, then the employer would be entitled actually to refuse the request. But if the employee fails to meet the eligibility requirements, then you will need to consider whether you want to accept the request or application and deal with it informally. And um, if you simply reject the request on the basis that the employee isn't eligible to make it, um, then just bear in mind that there may be other statutory protections that the employee has got. Um, so whether that's an indirect sex discrimination claim or an indirect um, uh, disability discrimination claim, it's still therefore worth you considering the request, even if the employee isn't eligible to make it under the statutory scheme. Um, if you then do proceed to deal with it, as an informal request outside the remit of the scheme, um, then it may also be worth you considering if you are going to reject it using one of the um, eight permitted grounds. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. So as I say, even if an employee is eligible, still give it some consideration because the employee could be um, protected in another way. Um, if the employee hasn't followed the correct procedure um, and therefore we could refuse the request on the basis that the employee hasn't done that and therefore it's a technical flaw um, and therefore we, we could say, well, we're not, we're not um, engaging with you on, on your request because you haven't followed the process. Um, again, bear in mind that there could be consequences of that, whether that be a claim or a grievance. Um, so um, if an employee doesn't um, follow the procedure correctly, it's worth informing them of that and asking them to resubmit their request and follow the process. Uh, 
Um, so if then the employee is eligible and they have followed the correct procedure, the legislation requires that if we are going to reject the request, we have to reject it on one of the eight permitted grounds. And there they are on the slide. So we've got the burden of additional costs, the detrimental effect on ability to meet customer demand, inability to reorganize work among existing staff, inability to recruit additional staff, detrimental impact on quality, detrimental impact on performance, and insufficiency of work during the periods the employee proposes to work. Um, and also the last one being planned structural changes. So these are substantial grounds and um, we just need to make sure that if we are rejecting a request, we refer to at least one of these in the decision letter. There's no actual statutory requirement for us to provide an, an explanation as to why we believe one of these grounds applies. But of course, um, we would strongly advise that you do that so that the employee can consider um, that full explanation um, and how it applies to the ground that you're relying on, um, as they may need to refer to that in any appeal. Um, and um, in, in providing a sufficient and full explanation, um, obviously what you're doing is, is you're um, defending, um, you're putting forward a, a potential defence to um, a claim that may be made against you. Um, in considering the matter of appeals, then the legislation doesn't actually expressly require an employer to allow an employee to appeal um, the employer's decision. So um, it's not a legislative requirement. Saying that, um, as the legislation makes it very clear that we have to deal with a request in a reasonable manner, one may argue that giving the employee the right to appeal the decision is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and of course, in all our processes and procedures, we usually do offer um, the employee a right to appeal. It is referred to in the ACAS guide as well. So, um, you know, we would strongly recommend that you give the employee the right to appeal. Um, usual um, steps apply in, in offering the employee the right to appeal. Um, uh, asking a manager who hasn't been um, involved in the process before to deal with it um, and also um, providing the decision in writing um, and of course the appeal hearing um, the employee should be permitted to be accompanied at that meeting by a trade union rep or a work colleague. Um, the next matter then I just want to um, alert you to about the statutory process is um, about withdrawing requests and treating requests as withdrawn. So if an employee actually withdraws their flexible working request, then they are still not permitted to make a further request within that 12 month period. So it's not treated as non-existent. Um, it's treated as being having been made, even if they withdraw it, in which case they can't make a further um, request within um, the next 12 months. Um, an employer will be entitled to notify the employee um, that it has decided that the employee's conduct is or amounts to a withdrawal of their request in two circumstances. And the circumstances are detailed on the slide. So if an employee without good reason fails to attend both the first meeting and any um, further meeting that is arranged to discuss their request, then the employer can treat the request as being withdrawn. And then secondly, if the employee um, without good reason fails to attend both the first meeting and then a rearranged meeting um, in terms of an appeal meeting, then um, again, we can treat the request as being withdrawn. So that is quite useful. Saying that, um, you know, the definition of without good reason isn't um, detailed in the guide or the code or the legislation, um, but, you know, is a common sense 
approach to be taken. So we need to look at the reasons why the employee is saying that they weren't able to attend both meetings um, and consider whether um, they're reasonable or not in the circumstances. Um, so then the next uh, matter I want to mention is dealing with several requests at the same time. And this may be pertinent to the existing situation with COVID because if you're faced with a situation whereby the, um, whether you're saying um, we want all employees to return to work, to the workplace on a specified date, and then you get a large number or a number of flexible working requests to remain working from home, um, then this is worth considering because um, the ACAS guide says that um, if the employer receives more than one request, um, then it needs to consider each of those requests on their merit. So it can't just group them together and make a decision, a blanket decision in respect of all of those requests. It needs to go through them individually um, and look at um, each of the individual circumstances that the employees uh, are detailing as to the reason why um, they want to work for, they want to um, work flexibly in the circumstances. Um, the ACAS guide says that requests should be considered in the order in which they are received. So that's helpful. Um, and because ultimately, um, you know, if, if one employee, if, if, if some employees make the requests early on, and then you get another um, uh, number of requests later on, um, the later requests, may not be able you may not be able to grant those because of the fact that you've granted the first requests but the guide is saying you need to look at the requests in the order that they are received now saying that of course you're going to have to give consideration to any um statutory protection rights that the individual employees have got so if they are referring to discrimination issues as to the reason why they want to remain working from home or they want to um, pursue their flexible working request, then of course you're going to have to give those employees more consideration, more detailed consideration than those employees who don't have those um, protected characteristics or um, protection rights. So although the guide is helpful in it saying that we need to consider the requests in the order that they are received, please make sure that you consider discrimination issues above that or alongside it. Healy? Um, yes. We just had a, a question. I think it's probably uh, time to ask it now. Yes. Should, people, should they come back to the workplace whilst you're considering the requests in terms of returning to the office? Um, yeah, okay. So if the, if the request is to continue working from home and the employer has already said, we want all employees back, um, then I don't think you've got any choice um, but to consider the employee's request whilst they continue working from home, albeit, you know, you could commence a disciplinary procedure at the same time. And I'm going to deal with that later on. Okay. Um, but yes, because um, you would hope that employees make these requests before the due date that they are or the date that they are due to return to work. And, I, and, and that's where the communication comes in from the employer, which we'll move on to in a moment. Um, so, uh, um, okay, so, and then the, then the third, um, the third point um, is that if you get a number of flexible working requests at the same time, um, then you might want to approach all the employees to see if you can reach a compromise or agreement with all of them. Because if it's a if it's a um, uh, if it's a position of you saying we can only grant um, five out of the ten, um, then it may be worth you informing the ten that that's the position so can we meet try and meet halfway on this or can we reach a compromise so we can actually deal with everybody's concerns it's a tricky one and as i say be alive with the discrimination issues 
Um, informal requests then just worth a quick mention. So if employees are not eligible to make the uh, statutory flexible working requests, they may still make informal requests and employees should still consider these if they believe that employees have protection rights um, or, or as general good practice anyway. Um, also, um, just looking at um, flexible working policies, we would um, recommend that obviously employers do have flexible working policies in place. Um, and it's worth putting these in place now if you don't have them, um, just so that it gives guidelines to employees as to the procedure. Um, that you want employees to follow in making the requests. Also, obviously, the permitted grounds that you can refuse requests on um, and who the procedure applies to, because it might be that you are uh, communicating a process that applies to all employees, whatever their length of service. Um, or you might want to just confirm that it only applies to those 26 weeks service. So it's entirely up to you. But but I would strongly suggest you put in place a policy so that if an employee does indicate that they do want to make flexible working requests, you can send that policy out to them or tell them where to access it so they know what the process is. And now on the slide is uh, some details really as to what the policy should include, and that's taken from the ACAS guide. Um, complaints then, if um, the procedure isn't complied with by the employer. Um, now, many people say that the complaints that can be made under the statutory scheme lack teeth um, and um, fail, the tribunals are not permitted to scrutinize the decisions made by employers generally. Um, so, you know, as I say, the criticism is that potentially the complaints that employees can make um, do lack teeth and they do, um, there's not there's not a huge amount that an employee can do about um, the matter if the procedure has followed, been followed to the letter and reference has been made to the eight permitted grounds. Um, so an, an employee who has made an application under the statutory procedure may bring a claim on the basis that um, the employer has failed to deal with the application um, in a reasonable manner. Um, the employer has failed to notify um, the employee of the decision on their application within the decision period. Um, the employer has rejected the application for a reason other than one of the statutory grounds. And the employer's decision to reject the application was based on incorrect facts. Um, and finally, the employer treated the application as withdrawn, but neither of the grounds entitling the employer to do so applied. So they're pretty limited um, claims that an employee can bring. As I say, the tribunal are not going to want to look into the commercial reasons as to why the employer has refused the request. Now, I'm not saying that they won't do that, because if an employee has also brought a claim for discrimination, then the tribunal will need to look into that complaint and will look at the circumstances surrounding why the employer has refused the request. But ultimately, this is a claim for breach of the statutory procedure that we're looking at here. Um, and as I say, the, the tribunal will only look at those claims. It won't consider um, all of the relevant background, really, in, in determining those claims. And it won't need to. So the time limit then for bringing uh, those claims, um, three months from the relevant date, i.e. the date the employee was notified of the decision, which is the usual one, um, or within such period as the tribunal considers reasonable, where it is satisfied that, the, um, that it was not possible to bring the claim within the initial three month time scale. But for our purposes, let's think about this three months. So three months from the date the decision is communicated, the employee has to bring a claim in the employment tribunal. And um, these claims are covered by a CAS early conciliation. Um, so the employee will need to log their complaint with ACAS before they can then lodge it in the employment tribunal. That has to be done within three months. Um, remedies then. Okay, so if we have uh, 
if an employee has brought a claim against us and um, succeeds in one of those claims that were listed on the previous slide, then um, the tribunal will have to make a declaration that the procedure has been breached in, in the way indicated, and also um, consider whether or not the request should be reconsidered. And they may ask the employer to do that. The other remedy or the additional remedy on top of that is an award of compensation to be paid by the employer. And it is capped at a maximum of eight weeks pay. And the eight weeks pay is the cap sum as um, uh, currently is um, £538. So it's not a big award um, for those claims. And that is another reason why um, there are complaints that, you know, this lacks teeth, these claims lack teeth. But as I say, we need to look at the other claims that an employee may be able to bring, i.e. discrimination claims that are uncapped damages uh, that may apply in the circumstances as well. Practical guidance then for you in dealing with um, these requests. Um, Firstly, we need to make sure we meet the statutory requirements in dealing with the requests. So we've gone through those. We need to make sure we deal with matters promptly within the decision period um, and that we refer to one of those eight grounds in refusing a request if we are going to refuse it, um, giving the employee the right to appeal. Um, secondly, employers should avoid those technicality points. So saying, uh, employee has failed to follow the procedure to the letter and therefore we're treating the um, uh, we're treating the request as withdrawn um, or we're refusing the request on that basis be very careful high risk approach um, and um, really the best approach would be to advise the employee where they've gone wrong and ask them to resubmit the request. Thirdly, then, employers should demonstrate serious consideration of the request. So although the legislation doesn't require you to go into details about why the particular ground or grounds apply in rejecting the request, my advice is you provide the detail and you then evidence that you have considered the request properly and thoroughly. Um, so it's it, it, it's, it's worth doing at that stage, at this early stage, to avoid any potential claims. The fourth suggestion is to um, uh, start from a positive point of view, um, seeking to overcome the potential issue. So tribunals are very critical of employers, starting from a point of, we, have, we can't do this, we, um, we're unable to facilitate this request because of one of the permitted grounds, instead of trying to work with the employee in, um, in trying to overcome it or reach a compromise, um, whether that's um, offering a trial period um, or it's um, discussion about a compromise situation, it's always best to try and engage with the employee about these requests before they are um, refused outright. The fifth then suggested step is for an employer to consider the alternatives um, other than the initial um, request. As I said, um, if it can't be met and we don't think it can be met, then consider alternatives, consider a compromise situation. Um, and then the employee will hopefully um, accept um, that you have tried to do as much as you can in dealing with their request um, and um, be, um, be, be less inclined to bring, bring a claim. Um, and then a further suggested step um, in dealing with a flexible working request is for an employer to consider the care to consider um, carefully. Yeah, so, so, so basically, if, if the role is one that cannot be performed flexibly in the employer's view, um, then we need to make sure that that is properly justifiable in the circumstances. So we've just got to be careful that we don't start off in a position, and this is about the, the positive perspective, really. Um, we don't start off in a position saying, um, no, this can't be entertained um, because, I don't know, it sets a precedent. 
um, we've just got to be careful. It doesn't, that isn't, that thinking isn't based on stereotypical, stereo, stereotypical assumptions of the business or of the department. Um, and we try and work through compromises or give detailed reasons as to why the role cannot be performed in the way that the employee is requesting um, and making sure that they are justifiable in the circumstances. Um, another step is for the employer to explain the decision and the reasons fully and clearly for the reasons that I've stated. And um, also um, applying um, the decisions consistently. So just be careful that you're not treating employees differently in the circumstances. Um, and that comes down to having proper procedures and processes in place um, so that um, different requests can be, or requests for the same thing can be considered alongside each other. Uh, of course, there's going to be individual circumstances that apply to different employees, um, but we need to be making sure that we're consistent in our approach. And then finally, um, let's just make sure that we, um, this is on the other page, yeah, that we maintain um, sufficient records. So again, that goes back to um, and will assist us in ensuring consistency of treatment. So making sure that we've got those records in place um, and, um, and to ensure that we, we can make sure that we're, we're treating everybody consistently or we're adopting a consistent approach. So we've now considered the flexible working requests in general. Um, it's necessary to consider these now in the context of COVID, which I know we've touched upon briefly, but this is moving on towards um, the present circumstances and in particular COVID. Um, as I've said, then we're going to probably see a number of flexible working requests being made by employees, particularly to remain working from home because of the positive experiences of that that the employees have experienced. Um, so um, what are other employers doing in the circumstances then to, pre to preempt these flexible working requests? Barclays Bank is already looking into a more um, decentralised approach to staff working. Um, they say the lockdown restrictions have created for them the perfect platform to test out concurrent remote working for 70,000 out of its 80,000 workforce. Um, in April 2020, so this was last year, the Barclays um, Chief Executive Jess Staley claimed that office blocks housing thousands of workers could become a thing of the past and that flexible working will become the norm. Um, now, obviously, that was last year, but I don't think that opinion has changed at all. Um, in March 2021, BP announced that it would be asking employees to spend 40% of their week working from home after lockdown restrictions are lifted as part of a shift towards a more flexible working pattern for its staff. Um, the, um, so BP have got 25,000 office-based employees. Um, they've been told that the new hybrid working model, um, which they have called BP Work Life, will offer individuals and teams a more flexible, engaging and dynamic way of working. In the BP statement, it says, um, over the past year, um, we have learned how effectively people can work remotely, but also the importance of collaboration and innovation and how this is still most effective face to face. Um, for the great majority of office-based workers across BP, this will balance time spent working together in the office with time working remotely at home or at other locations. And for most, this will likely be approximately 60-40 workplace home split, with full-time employees typically in the office three days a week. Teams, managers and individuals work together to decide the working arrangements that would best suit their needs. 
some roles will require people to be in the office or their prime location every day and some roles will require greater travel or connecting digitally with colleagues with less time in the office there may also be some colleagues who prefer working in the office more that's what the statement said so um, interesting there. HSBC has announced it would cut office space by 40%. Um, while um, a company Salesforce said that it would move to a work from anywhere pattern. Um, in contrast, um, Goldman Sachs boss David Solomon stated in February of this year that remote working is an aberration. Um, the investment bank CEO said that he was keen to correct the current home working situation as soon as possible, citing fears around new recruits getting the mentorship they need. So he's against it and wants everyone back in the office ASAP. Um, Chris Biggs, a partner at accounting and consultancy firm Fee to Global Advisors, said he doubted offices would reach pre-pandemic occupancy levels for a long time. Um, business leaders should not rush to get anywhere to get everyone back as soon as the government announces a start date. They should instead use common sense and judge on a case by case basis if employees want to come back or fit or feel safe to do so. I mean, what we can take from that is, is there's a real split. Um, and although a business can commence its uh, discussions about its preference in terms of is it pre-COVID level office working or is it a hybrid situation or is it predominantly home working um, it is going to be it's quite an individual thing both for the employees concerned as well as the businesses operationally so um, I mean it's it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because all businesses are going to be different and all employees' circumstances are going to be different. Some employees will want to come back to the office. Of course they will, all the time. Whereas um, some employers will want to stay, some employees will want to work from home. I think the hybrid situation is probably going to be the most popular. So what practical steps can we take now to deal with the situation? So, so really what we need to be doing now is considering our preferred for our staff um, home working or office working option. What fits best with your business? Um, what benefits and advantages have you experienced from people working predominantly from home? Um, and what disadvantages have you experienced? So how can those disadvantages be overcome? And is it by only bringing people back in the office full time or part time? Um, obviously, we've got a bit of time because um, based on the government's plan, um, most of the restrictions are going to be in place until the 21st of June, unless that's extended. So we can work um, with that date in mind in considering our preferred approach. <clears throat> um, if we are going to be adopting a more preferred um, home-based working or even a hybrid situation, um, we need to um, consider then the implications of that. Um, there has been studies, as we all know, that the mental health of employees from working at home has been affected um, and there's no switch off culture because um, the expectations are that employees are um, meant to be accessible at all times um, so we need to be careful we manage that if we are going to continue with the present arrangements or this hybrid situation um, but as I say a starting point is really for us to consider our preferred approach um, in considering that then secondly we need to think about the consequences of that approach and we touched on those a bit with the um, the the um, mental health issues but but if it's going to um, mean retaining people working from home we need to consider do we want to up our monitoring of that um, and can we do we want to monitor more employees performance or um, activities um, production levels at home um, if we do we need to think about um, how we do that without invading their privacy 
Um, and also um, we need to make sure we work to preserve employees um, working time rights in particular um, for them to take appropriate rest breaks. So, um, uh, we need to make sure health and safety both at home and in the office is catered for. So if people are working from home still, um, whether a hybrid model or predominantly working from home, then as I say, um, we need to make sure health and safety wise, we are doing what we can in respect to their mental health and um, uh, physical health, you know, in terms of uh, computer equipment, appropriate equipment, um, which, you know, most employers, I hope, will have, will have dealt with by now. Um, so in dealing then with um, looking at the consequences, the third or the next stage will mean communication and consultation with employees about preferred working pattern. Now, in that respect, then, um, we need to think about if we are looking at making permanent changes to employees' contracts of employment, um, whether um, we need to consult with them about it. Because usually if you make changes to, obviously, if you, if you make changes to an employee's um, contract of employment, you will need to consult with them about it and you'll need to obtain their agreement to change those terms. Um, if you can't get the employee's agreement to change those terms of employment, um, then the um, consequence or the, um, the, state, uh, the step that the employee, employer can take at that point is to consider dismissing or terminating the employee and offering them re-engagement on new terms. It's a risky approach. So obviously what we want to try and do is um, agree the changes to the terms and conditions of employment with the employee. So if we are um, requiring employees to work in a hybrid situation, um, i.e. some in some time in the office, some time at home, or um, requiring them to work from home permanently post lockdown measures being lifted, um, then we need to seek agreement to do that. Um, if there are more than 20 employees affected by the situation, we may also need to collectively consult with our staff through appropriate representatives. If we're pushing through those changes. Um, once then we have uh, um, consulted and uh, communicated with our employees, um, we need to determine the date on which the new working pattern um, is going to be implemented. So um, we need to think about the date, when we can do this and communicate it to employees. Now, if the situation involves a full or part-time or a part return to the office, the employer um, is going to need to fully consider how that is going to be facilitated. Um, we need to make sure that we comply with appropriate health and safety requirements communicated by the government at the relevant time. So social distancing measures are still going to be um, potentially enforced. Of course, they are. Um, so uh, all those things that we considered last year um, and uh, um, we will need to make sure they're in place. So hand sanitizing, cleaning. Um, socially distancing, wearing masks, consideration of travel into the office as well as out. Um, and um, it may be a staggered approach in terms of returning to the office and not all at one time. Um, and then finally, any stage an employee can make a um, flexible working request. So if they do, we need to make sure that we consider it um, uh, akin to or, or alongside in accordance with our process, our procedure and the statutory procedure if they qualify. Right, okay, so um, I think we've got some questions now um, that um, Eloise is going to um, put to me, um, which um, have arisen and it relates to the issues that may arise on a return to the um, office place working. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my slide there. And I think that um, we've got these questions. Yeah, there's just one other question I'd like to ask before we go on, if that's yeah. OK. Yes. Um, 
that Lynn's, um, Lynn's asked. So Lynn said they've got sales offices in eight of their hotel properties. Um, and there are a couple of individuals in each property that, that currently do have the facility to work from home. But her question is, how would we then manage any application from those that are not currently permitted to do so? Those that currently can are in management positions. So people in management positions are permitted to work from home. And then the other people aren't, but they want to make an application. I think it's looking at their job role. So if, if, you're, if that job role means that they need to come in, um, then that's a reason to refuse the request. But of course, you've got to look at one of those committed reasons. So if we go back to those reasons, and, and there'll be one or at least one of them that fit with the circumstances because they are broad. So if it's, it's looking at the job role, it's um, ensuring that um, if it is the case that they can't, uh, they can't do the role without coming into, into the workplace and then um, going through the process and uh, um, determining which of those grounds apply. I'm just trying to find the grounds, just one second. Um... Yeah, so yeah. Well, it's a detrimental impact on performance. Um, it's an insufficiency potentially of work during the period the employee proposes to work. If they're saying, you know, I'm working from home, but there's not the work for them to do at home because they've got to do it in the workplace. Um, so it's the um, impact on quality, impact on performance, um, detrimental, in, uh, detrimental effect on ability to meet customer, customer demands, because ultimately you can't, they can't do their job, they can't, uh, they can't do the job unless it's actually in the workplace. Is that what we're saying in, that, in, in terms of that role, well, I think, isn't it? I think so. Um, Lynn can put some feedback in the chat box or if, um, if that's not what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, it's all of those things. Ultimately, they can't perform the job without being in the, in the workplace, whether on a, a full-time or a part-time basis. So I suppose we just need to look at the role, determine if that is the case. If some mm. of the elements can be worked from home, then they might be able to work partly from home to deal with those elements. The elements of the role that they can't do um, at home, then they will need to come in to do them. And the reason why you wouldn't be able to grant the request for them to work all the time from home is because the job can't be performed at home. The whole job can't be performed at home. And that would affect, that would be a detrimental impact on performance and detrimental impact on quality. I would stick it within those two grounds, to be honest. Yeah, she said she's just put in the chat, but some of the work would be done by email. Um, which I guess could be done from home, but some would be answering the telephone calls to the hotel in regards to sales bookings. Well, that can't be done from home and, unless uh, you've got a phone system which allows that. So, so I think, you know, obviously what you're saying fits in with what, um, with what Lynn's just said in the chat box. So other questions that we've had in Keely is, um, what if employees refuse to return to work? Yeah, okay, so this is a case where we as the employer have said, um, we want everybody to come back. You know, we've looked at the health and safety obligations on us to do that. We've worked through those. We've communicated with the staff how we want them to return. And an employee says, no, I'm not, I'm not returning. Um, I don't want to come in. So at that point, we need to look at the reasons why they're indicating they do not want to return to work. Um, and um, if it is a flexible working request that we want them to make, we ask them, you need to make a flexible working request in accordance with that procedure. Your contract requires you to work in the workplace. That is now what we're requiring to, you to do. Now lockdown measures have been lifted. Um, and therefore, if you want to change your contract, you need to make a flexible working request. And we go through that procedure. If we reject the flexible working request, and and they still refuse to return to the workplace, then it becomes a disciplinary matter. 
So, um, and that is under the, I mean, it's potential gross misconduct. So it's um, unauthorized absence from the workplace um, or it's um, an unreasonable refusal to return um, to work um, because we've worked through the reasons as to why we believe that they should be returning to work. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, it becomes then a disciplinary matter that ultimately the employee could be dismissed for. But it's crucial that we look at the reasons why the employee is saying that they do not want to return to work um, and, um, and work through those reasons with the employee. Because if they're potentially discriminatory, um, then we need to be able to justify our request that they return to the workplace to work. We've, we've just had another um, live question in it, Keely, if it's all right. Um, so um, another person has asked, one, um, one FW request, so, sorry, I'm not... Information. Uh, one FW request has come in from, from full-time to part-time. Oh, sorry, one flexible working request. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God! <laughs> long week and it's only Wednesday yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right one flexible working request has come in from full-time to part-time requesting two days in the office two days working from home yeah. this has been approved by managers however whilst we are currently working on home on a home working policy an ergonomic assessment the CEO wants all staff to carry this out he says it's better to do this before we accept any approval but I think whilst this has not been finalized i.e the policy can we not simply approve the four days and then uh, four days and then go back to her once the policy is in place? Yeah, I think that's reasonable because obviously we're in, you know, at the moment the guidance is work from home um, unless it's not possible. So um, although she's required, we're, she's requesting to work two days in the office, two days at home. At the moment, it's it's a home working situation. So. Um, I think you can probably potentially park or suspend the decision on the um, two days in the office um, until um, you've determined your policy and until the lockdown measures have been lifted. Um, obviously, what you need to do with the employee is agree an extension to the decision period in respect of that element of her request and make sure that the extension of the decision period is confirmed in writing, because otherwise you're going to be in breach of the statutory procedure. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so next question, can an employer force employees to have the vaccine before they, before they allow employees to return to work? Yeah, so this is the issue about mandatory vaccination. So an employer at the moment can, can take the view um, that um, employees should not be returning to the office um, and the place of work unless they have had the vaccination. Um, yeah, an employer can do it. It's, um, it would be a requirement from the individual employer. This is not a government initiative. The government have made very clear that they are not pushing through mandatory vaccinations, even in the um, healthcare sector. So it will not be legislation at the moment. Um, but an employer could decide individually that that's the stance it wants to take. Um, saying that, is that fair? Um, probably not at the moment because of the fact that um, until such time as everybody's had the opportunity to have a vaccination, um, it's going to be indirectly discriminatory against younger people as opposed mm -hmm. to older people because um, younger people haven't been um, offered the vaccine and won't be offered the vaccine until probably back end of June. So, you know, I know they're pushing through the vaccinations to be completed by the end of June. That's the first vaccination. So um, if, you're, if you're wanting to do that now, then it, it's going to be unfair on the younger age group. Um, and then what's the implication? So are you going to be saying you can't return to the workplace and we're not going to pay you if you can't return to the workplace? So that then creates more issues and you're going to be facing potential constructive dismissal claims there. Um, and discrimination claims. So at the moment, um, I think the best thing for employers to do are look at alternative ways of trying to support staff um, in, um, in, in getting them to um, accept 
their offers of the vaccinations and going to have the vaccines. So um, that may be um, in a number of ways. It may be that you um, communicate to all employees the advantages, disadvantages of the vaccinations, um, of um, supporting them in terms of um, paying employees um, when they go and have their vaccinations rather than requiring them to take it as unpaid leave. Um, and um, generally um, offering um, support and information to try and influence and um, persuade um, employees to have those vaccinations. Of course, there's always going to be a situation where some employees say, I don't want the vaccination and it's not going to be appropriate for everyone. Um, so that needs to be considered as well, because if you're saying, well, we're not um, having employees in the workplace who haven't had the vaccination, there are some people who can't have it. Um, and in those categories, we're looking at pregnant mm. women, we're looking at people with suppressed immunity systems um, and disorders, which potentially is a disability. Um, and people with long term COVID um, are excluded at the moment from the vaccinations. Um, also, um, requiring an employee to be vaccinated without their consent as a condition to them coming into work or conducting their work could amount to, as I say, a repudiated breach of contract, a serious breach of contract, entitling them to claim constructive dismissal, especially if you're saying we're not paying you. Um, mm. Thirdly, um, on that, um, I think we need to look at the um, uh, the um, issues of discrimination, as I've just touched upon. Um, if we are saying um, that we're not allowing people to return to work who haven't had the vaccination, that's going to affect potentially um, disabled employees, um, I say pregnant employees, and then we're getting into discrimination grounds. Um, and, and age, as I said, because mm. they're not offering the, the vaccine to, to um, younger people as yet. Um, uh, vaccination requirements may be difficult also on um, health and safety grounds. Um, it's a really, it's a really unlikely event that people are going to um, experience side effects or um, uh, illnesses as a result of vaccinations but some people do and you know if you're saying to employees you have to have a vaccination before you can return to work and be paid um, they go off and have a vaccination and then are ill um, you may face claim of personal injury in the same way as you could face a claim of personal injury if you bring people back into the workplace and they contract covid in the workplace but hopefully we'll have the health and safety measures in place to prevent that um, and um, uh, yeah, negative publicity is also one to, to keep in mind because if you're forcing mandatory vaccinations on employees um, as a requirement for them to return to work, um, you may find yourselves in the paper um, with some negative um, publicity. So what are the alternatives to mandatory vaccination? Yeah, so it's more the support. So really, we're looking at properly, um, properly communicated vaccination policies. Um, so we want to try and provide as much information um, about the reasons, you know, that that's one of our health and safety obligations to our staff to make sure we communicate the appropriate information to them, um, and inform them of the advantages, um, and the um, uh, you know, the benefits of having vaccination. Um, of course, we'll have to inform them of some of the disadvantages as well, but, but you know, really push the advantages, giving them paid time off to attend vaccination appointments. Um, in these policies as well, dealing with things like uh, potential conflicts between those who are vaccinated and those who aren't vaccinated in the workplace. So, um, how we're going to manage that potentially, um, and also, um, uh, you know, communicating to staff that your priority is to um, ensure their safety in the workplace, 
alongside vac- you know alongside asking them if, if or, or supporting them in a vaccination supporting them in um, having vaccinations but also making sure that we have in place the health and safety measures to protect them aside from vaccination so the hand sanitizing the cleaning all those yeah. measures that we we looked at before so can an employer prevent unvaccinated employees from entering the workplace if they want to yeah they could yeah it's up to the employer um, but ultimately there may well be consequences yeah. for that because it, it's not legislation it's not a legal requirement um, for people to be vaccinated so and you've got these categories of people who who aren't able to be vaccinated mm. so um, although employers can do this there are risks associated to it um, I mean, if you've got employees on a zero hours contract who are refusing to have the vaccine, then of course you could not offer them any hours. But look at the discrimination element of that potentially, if there are any. Um, if people are working on salaried or fixed term hour contracts, um, then um, we need to look at whether or not we can continue working, uh, continue with those people working from home um and if the role can be carried out remotely then we can do that um bearing in mind um that those who do return to the office um uh, could argue that they've been treated unfairly because they haven't been given the op- opportunity to work from home as well so um yeah it's it, it and it might be that we look more than this hybrid working arrangement um to reach a compromise with all mm-hmm. staff Okay, so do you th- um, should an employer um, require employees to sign a vaccination waiver? Yes, yeah, so a vaccination waiver being um, that if we require employees to be vaccinated um, and they refuse, then we say, yeah. okay, well, you need to sign a waiver then to confirm um, that um, you're refusing to have a vaccination. Um, and that you're um, uh, not therefore going to bring any complaint against us um, if you subsequently contract COVID in the workplace um, and become ill from it. Um, I mean, the the problem with that, of course, is that we cannot exclude liability for personal injury. So, and also on top of that, um, we have our other obligations alongside um, a requirement if we do decide to do this a requirement to have um, employees vaccinated um, to provide a, a safe working environment and comply with the health and safety obligations so um, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to get them to sign waivers <laughs> yeah. yeah okay so can employers introduce a contractual requirement for employees to be vaccinated again yes they can if they're trying to force a uh, changing the contract of employment on employees, then um, be mindful of that because by um, uh, forcing those changes, employees could resign, bring claims for constructive unfair dismissal. Um, they may not accept the changes and therefore resign, um, or they, um, or we might have to dismiss and offer re-engagement on the new terms to force the new term through. Um, so um, it's it's very risky, really. And at the mm. moment, because of the government's stance on um, not pushing through mandatory vaccinations, then um, I think it's going to be very difficult for employers to do this. So what's the alternative then, do you think, Keely? The alternative yeah. to introducing a contractual requirement? Yeah, so we go back to trying to influence, trying to support employees to get vaccine with the in the knowledge that we cannot, we won't be able to force everybody, won't be able to influence everybody to get them. And and some people may not be able to have them. Um, So I'd work with the vaccination policy. I'd work with trying to um, uh, provide information to employees, paid leave to get vaccinations, um, and then um, trying to um, uh, and communication to employees about why some people won't be able to be vaccinated as well. Okay. And, and looking then maybe at this hybrid situation and, and maybe for some roles allowing continuation of home working. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got another couple of questions, Keely, if that's OK. Um, so one from Rachel, she said um, they've got two members of a team that are currently working from home. The other four team members are in the office. 
these two team members are being told they must return to the office from the 29th of March like everybody else right. and not June. Yeah. But do not want uh, do not want to. Is this reasonable, acceptable that the employer makes the demand of 29th of March? Well, I think I think we need to look at the reasons why these two individuals are refusing to return to the workplace. So um, we need to ask them to make flexible working requests if they qualify for the statutory scheme or in any case. Um, and we need to then look at the reasons why they're saying that they want a permanent change to their contracts, if that's what they're seeking, to remain working from home. Um, and depending on those reasons, we may or may not um, be able to reject those requests um, and then um, commence disciplinary proceedings if they refuse to return. But it all boils down to the reasons, because ultimately, if the reasons relate to, say, a disability, are still shielding until the end of March, or, um, uh, or it might be in relation to childcare, um, then I think, you know, then we're in the territory of potentially disability discrimination or sex discrimination. So we have to um, tread carefully and it, it really depends on the reasons that they're putting forward. Ultimately, if there are no potentially discriminatory reasons, then, you know, we can make a, we can take a more forceful approach on it. But we need to look at those reasons. OK, uh, Rachel, put something in the chat box if um, if you've got any follow on from that. Um, another uh, quick question. So can employers um, ask employees to confirm if they have or haven't had a vaccine? Yeah, you can do. And I just need to think about the data protection issues on that. But okay. yeah, there's no reason why you can't ask employers, uh, can't ask employees to confirm whether or not they've had the vaccine. Um, so data protection obligations are crucial in obtaining information like that. It falls into sensitive personal data. Um, so we have to be um, processing it um, for one of the or for a permitted reason. Um, and if it is to ensure our um, compliance with health and safety obligations on us, that might be permitted. Um, we need to make sure that that data is secure um, and um, and that we use it appropriately. Um, so yes, we can we can ask that information. We need to think about why why are we asking for it. If we're asking for it because we're going to be asking all employees to return to the workplace on a certain date, and therefore we need to try and make sure we can manage the risk associated with that, then that might be satisfactory. But if we're just asking for no reason, we haven't got a date in mind and we haven't even decided whether we want people to return to the office, then I think it's probably a bit premature asking for that information. So we need to be very clear as to the reasons why we want that information. Brilliant. Thank you, Keely. Thank you so much. Uh, another great session. If anybody's got any more questions, pop them in the chat box now because uh, we're obviously just getting ready to um, to wrap up. So Keely, thank you again. I know we all really appreciate your advice and support. Um, oh, Rachel's just replied, both team members are stating they can continue to do their jobs from home as the government guidelines, as per the government guidelines and simply do not want to return yet. Ah, well, that's more, you can potentially take a more forceful approach on that, as long as you believe that the roles do need to be um, conducted in the office. And then you can also look at, you know, the um, unfair situation between the four that have returned and the two that are still, um, that are still um, uh, working from home and manage that situation. Because if it is causing grievances and issues between the four and the two, um, then I think that that's, you know, it needs to be addressed. Mm. Um, yeah, I saw that. I saw that pop up. Uh, in my slides, there will be a bit more on the vaccination policy. So um, if I'll obviously send them to you, Eloise, so that you can then send them out so that people have got them if they want to draft their vaccination policies. Yeah, great. What I'll do, everybody, is I'll... Um, the recording will be edited that takes um, a few days to do that so I'll make sure that the recording is sent to you within uh, within the week but I'll send the um, the slides um, today so you've got them today if you wanted to do anything um, more quickly than uh, having the recording so 
Um, thank you everybody for, for investing your time and spending time with us. Um, the next session that I'm planning for the HR huddle um, is going to be on diversity and inclusion. Um, but if there's any other topics that you want me to cover, then, then please let me know, send me a message or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and it'd be great to cover topics that you want, you want to hear more about. So thank you again, Keely. Thank you, everybody. And um, I'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye.